We'll delve deeper into antibiotics with shocking revelations as of now that farmers are using antibiotics to fatten their animals. We'll discuss the use and the misuse of antibiotics. And to do that, I'm joined in studio by Dr. Karanja, former uh, president of PSK, Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, and Dr. Sylvia Opanga, lecturer at the University of Nairobi, both lecturers at the University of Nairobi. Ladies and gentlemen, many thanks for talking to us this morning here on KTN News. Today marks the end of the World Antibiotics Awareness uh, Week 2018. To start us off, Dr. Sylvia, how much of information, how much of awareness in regards to antibiotics do the Kenyan populace have? Well, that is almost nil. Um, I don't think the populace has a lot of information on antibiotics uh, because studies have actually shown these are the same people that will go to a pharmacy and request antibiotics over the counter. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the message has been gotten out there to the populace. But what I know right now is that the Ministry of Health um, has a national action plan on antimicrobial resistance and one of the ob objectives is actually to create awareness among the human uh, uh, the human beings around here to create um, awareness among the population mm -hmm. yeah about antimicrobial <coughs> resistance so i think that's something that we are going to do we'll come to the resistance a little bit later let me get dr karanja to the conversation and who is supposed to give this information who is to make the public aware of the kind of medicine that they are using? Primarily, it is the professionals when they interact with the patients, it is their duty to inform the patients about the medicines they are using, about the dangers of misusing them, about the dangers of not completing their dosages, about the importance of complying with the information and the directions given. For after that, it is also the duty of the media, like we are now sitting here, okay. to help educate the general public because indeed and sometimes in the healthcare settings patients because they are a stress they may not pick up some of this information they're just interested in getting what they want and in that situation they walk away and they miss out on the key messages about the drugs and the importance particularly of antibiotics these very life-saving drugs uh, dr. Sylvia the World Health Organization says and I quote urgent action is needed to curb unnecessary consumption of antibiotics why is there a need to curb the consumption of antibiotics? Several things, yeah? The first one is that uh, the resistance patterns have been recorded, and resistance actually means the bacteria have evolved in such a way that even if you administer the medication, they're not going to die, they're self-preserving. So the constant exposure to antibiotics is making the bacteria now survive the antibiotics. Now. If you look at um, recorded, uh, if you look in literature, uh, people are dying a lot of antimicrobial resistance, okay, because of in indiscriminate antibiotic use. So to reduce that death, okay, you have to limit the antibiotics that are being used. The other thing is that um, if you look at production in the pharmaceutical industry, Antibiotics really don't give a lot of return on investment, you know. People want to make their money. So there's massive production, is that what you're saying? No, there's no massive production. Mm -hmm. What now I'm saying is that antibiotics, uh, we are losing out. The production pipeline for antibiotics is running dry because of the return on investment <coughs> and because of this um, propensity for bacteria to develop resistance, people are not making money. And people are switching to cancer drugs. They are switching to drugs for chronic diseases. Because, I mean, you're treating someone for life, for diabetes, of course, you're more likely to invest in that than an antibiotic where someone uses for seven days. Within a few years, resistance has developed. So mm -hmm. we actually have to save what we have. All right, save the little antibiotics we have mm -hmm. from resistance so that people are not necessarily dying from infection. Uh, Dr. Karanja, when I asked you who is to give this uh, information to the public, you said of partly the media and also the trained physicians. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the question of qualified individuals and also quacks. How much of uh, a problem is that to the industry that you can't really differentiate who is qualified and who is literally a quack? Now, uh, sadly, in our environment, um, you'll see all manner of 
clinics out there, and you will never know who is in them. Uh, you see all manner of pharmacies out there, and the public cannot know, because they assume when you see a clinic, it is a qualified person. Sadly, there's a lot of illegal clinics, illegal pharmacies, which are run by completely unqualified people, people who are renting licenses, people who are there to make the money, exposing the public to these great dangers. When you say renting licenses for purposes of our viewers, yes. what do you mean? What I mean, for example, some of these uh, poorly qualified people are in the business of renting their licenses to, un to quacks, to open up, for example, pharmacies. We know it for a fact that um, th there are those people who have been uh, illegally uh, allowed to be licensed to run pharmacies. And they are on the media uh, advertising their licenses for sale to quacks. That is the, in evidence. What, is, what does this do to the public? Is that the public is now being exposed to people who know nothing about medicines, and who are accessing these drugs inappropriately, they are therefore misusing them. And hence the problem we are talking about of resistance, particularly to antibiotics. That's a major danger because the laws, although they are there, sadly, in the case of pharmacy, they have not been implemented. Mm -hmm. There are people who are getting licenses illegally mm -hmm. in accordance with the law. When you go to the Constitution, what does it tell us? You need to ensure Kenyans are accessing the highest attainable quality of health. Part of that is through qualified professionals. So, Government, through legislation and through uh, implementing the same, will, has to make sure it's a constitutional demand. Mm -hmm. It is not happening right now. Mm -hmm. And yet, even the registration that is there is being weakened further. We have seen in the, in the recent past. Uh, Dr. Sylvia, shocking uh, reports show that farmers are using antibiotics to fatten their animals, mm -hmm. animals that are later consumed by human beings through their food. They're using the specified uh, antibiotics, uh, penicillin and tetra. Cycling. Cycling. Yes. In high dosage in chicken, pork, and beef. Mm -hmm. How much of danger does this pose to the, to the consumer? Huge dangers. Because, first of all, you have, you're consuming animals that have high uh, quantities of antibiotics in them. Okay? So if there was any resistance, it's passed from that animal to the human being. So that when you get an infection, and if there was penicillin or tetracycline used and you need it, then it will not be effective. Actually, this week we were at the AMR Antimicrobial Resistance Symposium, and someone presented a study saying that actually 70% of antibiotic misuse happens within the veterinary um, sector, not the human sector. So it's a huge problem. You're eating your nyamachoma, you're eating your chicken, lest with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. That's a huge problem. And what is the health hazardness of having these uh, antibiotics in the body without you necessarily not having any bacteria within your body? Well, clearly, when the bacteria, which are always around us, sometimes they are not causing an infection because the body, the immune systems are dealing with them. But when you're exposing the body to antibiotics, these microorganisms are developing defense mechanisms so that when you actually fall sick, then those antibiotics are no longer going to be effective. That is a danger. Continuous exposure of microorganisms that are normally around, but when they hit you in terms of an infection, perhaps because your immunity has gone down for some reason, then you cannot benefit from those because of that continual unnecessary exposure. Mm -hmm. We'll come to drug resistance, of course, uh, cases a little bit later. But, but let me get back to the World Health Organization, which says antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health. Modern statistics now depict of drug-resistant infections killing around 700,000 globally people every year, and it's set to rise to 10 million deaths annually 2050. Before I ask you any question, let's get to the basics. What are antibiotics used for? Antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections, okay? So if you have an infection with bacteria, you will need an antibiotic. If you have a viral infection or a flu, you don't need an antibiotic, okay? Mm -hmm. If you have a fungal infection, you don't need an antibiotic, okay? So the bigger picture is actually what are called antimicrobials. So they contain antifungals, antivirals, and antibiotics. But antibiotics specifically are used for 
treatment of bacterial infections. And when you hear, Dr. Karanja, such statistics, 700,000 people globally every year die, and the number is said to increase to 10 million deaths annually by 2050 due to drug-resistant infection. This must be worrying in the medical field, is it? It is indeed worrying. And uh, since the, 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 the discovery of uh, penicillin in 1928, the, um, the global impact of antibiotics has been to increase the life expectancy to the current about 70.5 years. Now, if antibiotics lose their effectiveness, the impact globally is huge. You are going to reduce life expectancy to 50 years, down to at least 20 years. So that's huge. That's how big it is. So you can see the, the, the revolution that brought antibiotics, the impact, and the current dangers of misuse. When people are trying to make money by using these very life-saving drugs, the impact rolling back these gains is huge. And in, particularly in Kenya, because we are in a very dangerous situation in Kenya, where our regulations are completely ignored. Globally, I think we are about the worst environment. The hygiene in our legislation in Kenya is very poor, mm -hmm. so that uh, one can Dr. Kanja, I read it somewhere yes. that Kenya is considered a dangerous place when it comes to drug resistance and even the antibiotics. Is that true scientifically? Now, it is, there is evidence emerging, mm -hmm. and with the continual research which is being done in Cambria and elsewhere, that Kenya will soon be marked and flagged as a dangerous place to be sick because simply if you fall sick in Kenya, the kind of bacteria which have been exposed to these antibiotics unnecessarily are going to be that that infection cannot be treated here. What does that mean? It means people will see Kenya as a dangerous place to be in. A tourist may think twice. You know, you heard about travel warnings. Mm -hmm. We may soon begin to get travel warnings to Kenya. Don't get there because if you get sick, the antibiotics there, will, which work elsewhere, cannot work. So that is a real problem in Kenya. Even if the person is a visitor coming to Kenya, probably even for the first time. Absolutely, absolutely. Because they will fall sick here with the bacteria that have been so mis mistreated and exposed here. So that rhythm, that infection, they, they will simply not be able to. For example, we have now what is called the MDRTB. Mm -hmm. These are huge uh, problem in terms of uh, you know how do you treat. Them. You need a huge budget. Our country right now is 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 dealing with UHC. For you to deal with UHC, you must make sure the drugs that are there are going to be effective in dealing with the, with the conditions. Otherwise, you're going to need more expensive medication. Your budgets cannot contain that. So, as a priority, government must deal with this issue of the effectiveness of drugs, because without those, you cannot achieve UFC, which our president is really... Uh, Dr. Sylvia, listening to you, you painted a picture of when you have a flu, it's not a must you be given an antibiotic. I've count lost individually of the number of times I have been uh, to seek medication for flu mm -hmm. that I was given uh, an antibiotic. Wh why is that case? Well, unqualified people handling medication, that's the issue. A flu is viral. Mm -hmm. Within five to seven days, someone has already um, gotten well. The illness has resolved. Without you taking really any medication necessarily? Yes. For a cold or a flu, you actually don't need medicine because it's self-limiting. It goes away. Mm -hmm. You might need something to relieve your symptoms, but you don't need an antibiotic for a viral infection. But the current situation is that someone comes to the pharmacy, uh, they are coughing, they have a small irritation in the throat, antibiotics are given. Sometimes they give very strong antibiotics. Mm -hmm. The other thing is also um, unqualified people receiving a prescription, a valid prescription written by a doctor, someone substitutes with the wrong antibiotics. So there's a lot of misuse of antibiotics. Doesn't that go against the, the hypocritic it oath does. of first do no, not have? Interestingly, people who are doing that don't even, have not even uh, uh, taken the Hippocratic oath. They are not professionals. We actually carried out a study and it's published. I was one of the authors and it showed that pharmacies that are run by qualified pharmacists do not have antibiotic misuse as opposed to those that are run by unqualified people. And then a second study shows that unqualified people don't have a lot of knowledge on antibiotics compared to qualified people. Mm -hmm. So what's going out there is that the market is actually flooded with people who are actually supposed to be under supervision, but they're running independently. And that's why you're having 
indiscriminate use of antibiotics and people just prescribing antibiotics over the counter without a doctor's prescription. Uh, Dr. Karanja, Dr. Sylvia talks of the markets being free, that anyone can set up a chemist anywhere in this country and sell antibiotics, be used for diseases that is not supposed to be used for. That should be a danger, is it? And honestly, and a big one, and any member of the public out there knows that any Tom, Dick, and Harry in this country today can set up a pharmacy tomorrow. Any building coming up before the paint is dry, you see a pharmacy. Why? That is a clear indication of a poor regulation. That means, as we are talking now, qualified pharmacies are finding themselves being pushed out by quarks. Why? Because the kind of things these people are doing on the market, the pharmacies cannot do. So you find you cannot compete. You were you to compete. I'm the chairman of the Legal and Ethics Committee. As a pharmacist, you are not supposed to do certain things, to allow certain things to happen. But when you're in an environment where people, everything goes, then you find you cannot operate. So pharmacies are opting to quit. And you find more and more that space is occupied by non-pharmacists. And that is a real danger. When you think, why does a society create, uh, like Kenya, create professionals for its own need to protect it? Now, when you push out people who should be protecting you, and that is the purpose of the law, to protect your rights, and then you weaken that law, and you push out people who you trained mm -hmm. so that you are not now protected. Now, where are we going with this? Kenyans, this business of making money, at, that anything goes with making money, it has to stop, and particularly in health. It has to stop, because we are facing an existential threat here. For and, and answering the question of it has to stop, how do I, as a Kenyan, who walks in the streets of this beautiful country, gets to a chemist to buy probably uh, medicine for a certain or particular disease, get to know that the person whom I'm dealing with is either a professional or a quack. Currently, the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, uh, to whom I'm the chair of Legal and Ethics Committee, like I've said, have a strategy right now to come up with what is called the Green Cross. Now, that is supposed to be the symbol. When it's rolled out, it's going to be rolled out so that when the public sees that symbol on the pharmacy, it will tell them, this is a pharmacy that has a qualified person, it is, the standards are there, so the drugs that are there are right, the information you get there is right, and the, the drugs you get there, you only get those drugs that are necessary for you. You don't get drugs on demand. That's what pharmacies do. They'll tell you, no, no, you don't need this one. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you, no, not every ailment requires medicine, as you just told you. But if you are there to open doors just to give issue stuff like uh, sweets, that is what we have in the country, and that has to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, who often is the gatekeeper in, in, in medicine? Now, globally, everywhere in the world, when you go to America, you go to Europe, the gatekeeper recognized globally is a pharmacist. The individual is, pharmacist. The pharmacist, who is qualified, who is a degree holder. That is a person who the society has placed in position with a sufficient knowledge and with the law supporting him, so that it is their duty to protect the public in terms of medicines. That is a global practice. Now, if you change that to something else, if you move that bar to a lower level, as has happened in Kenya, contrary to global practice, now, that is where the danger comes. That is where medicines are now being accepted everywhere like sweets, because if people were handling them, they're just looking for money. They will get two pills, three pills, 10 pills, as long as they get the money, they don't care. They don't know the dangers that are involved in two, three pieces of, of, of capsules that we're handing out to a patient, as long as they're exchanging money. That has to stop. Fair enough. Dr. Sylvia Opanga, medicine does not often make itself. It's made by companies. Yes. Which begs the question, do these companies that are producing medicine have the interest of the people at heart, or it is a push and pull for gaining markets? Well, they, uh, the companies that produce antibiotics and other medicines obviously have the best interests of people at heart, okay? Even when they flood the markets with this medicine? Now, you see, real good companies don't flood, okay? But because we have a free market, okay, then you can have people importing drugs from left, right, center, China, India, everywhere, okay? So the market is flooded with products from everywhere. But we actually need to have a system where there are controls as to who is bringing in medicine, what is the quality of medicine, and how is it helpful to the people. Companies that are producing medicine have to be vetted. 
this week actually we have uh, this week and actually this month there have been reports by the FDA stopping some heart medication because it's produced in China and it's laced with carcinogens compounds that cause cancer now that means we have to actually vet what's coming into Kenya Kenya is a free market yes but which kind of drugs are coming in? Are we having substandard antibiotics, for example, coming into the market just because it's a free market? Are we having counterfeits coming in, which will not, of course, be effective in treating infections? Mm -hmm. So companies that produce uh, antibiotics have best interests at heart, but there are also other players who are just in there to make money. So we actually need, as a country, to vet who Dr. brings in drugs. Dr. Karanja, we talked this you mentioned it out of your replies of drug resistant infections to of course make it clear to our audience what is a drug resistant infection a drug resistant infection is one in which the microorganisms that is involved in that infection has been exposed to these medicines long enough for it to defend in defending itself it mutates it creates resistance so that those drugs can no longer hit it. It means you have to look for stronger medicines so, which have not uh, gone through that process. And those stronger medicines will be more expensive. That is why I said in trying to deal, for example, with the UHC, you want to use the cheapest medicines. The cheapest um, medicines are the uh, generation. We talk about generations. Mm -hmm. Now, when you apply those, they are cost effective. Your budgets can do that. But when you are now exposed to uh, 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 is resistant infection. You are going to require much higher budgets, more expensive medicines, and the morbidity is going to be increasingly high in the country. You're painting a picture of continuously using one type of an antibiotics without getting help, without necessarily feeling any change. Is that the case? You see, what there is is that the medicines that are there on the market, that are available, are being used. The general medicine that should be working. When you are inappropriately using the wrong dosages, wrong indications, wrong durations. It means those medicines become ineffective over time. They become useless as life-saving drugs. And is it the medicines that become ineffective or it is the human body that changes to how it receives no, that no, medicine? No, no, the human body does not change. Mm -hmm. It is micro, microorganisms, due to that exposure, unnecessary exposure to medicines, develops it is a survival mechanism for it. Remember, this is something which when you expose it, it develops its way to survive. That is what we call resistance. It is able to survive that antibiotic over time, which means you need a bigger gun, a bigger antibiotic, a more powerful antibiotic, which the companies are not, as you said earlier, they are not developing. Why? Because it's not a uh, big Profitable business for them. them. They would rather do something for uh, hypertension, uh, not this non-communicable disease, where the, globally, there's a huge market. So it means then, if you don't protect the few antibiotics that are there today, we are facing a serious crisis, existential crisis, that people will just be falling sick. As I said, over 200 million people have been saved by antibiotics. When they disappear, it means people will be dying of simple infections. Meningitis, uh, for example, was killing 90% of children before penicillin. We are going to go back to that scenario. Uh, but then often, where does rather the abuse of antibiotics begin from? Well, the abuse of antibiotics begins from, we are all players, by the way, yeah? It begins with you and me. If you're going to a pharmacy to say, Nipatia Amoxil, and then you're just given, that's misuse. Because as a professional, I'm supposed to find out what that Amoxil is for. I'm supposed to ask for your prescription, I'm supposed to sit you down and find out if there are any other drugs you're taking that might interfere with the function of that amoxil. Which does not happen every time. It doesn't it? happen because unqualified people are out there running pharmacies who don't have this knowledge. Yeah. So it starts with me and you. Don't go to a pharmacy to ask for antibiotics. It also, um, the professional regulation needs to be there. Qualified people have to prescribe qualified people have to dispense antibiotics. So I think uh, with that, we need to actually have campaigns to educate people. Because sometimes people just innocently buy antibiotics. Or you're at home, your mother suffered this, 
acapona, mm -hmm. she left some medication there, you start taking it. And since you have it. the same symptoms yeah, and signs, so you have the you same start symptoms, using. you start uh -huh. using, sharing yeah. medication. Let me ask so, Dr. Karanja, yes. what alternatives do we have to antibiotics then? None. I mean, when you need an antibiotic, let's be clear, when you need an antibiotic, because there is an infection that requires an antibiotic, really, it's like when you have malaria, you must have something to hit that uh, agent, whether it's the, 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 the parasite or the, 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 the microbe, the, the bacteria that is treating. So my, there is no, that is what we are saying and we're insisting here. If you and, don't save them. And in the event that you continuously use these antibiotics and they are not healing you, there is no alternative to that? No. There is no alternative no. to that. The alternative is you're going to die. <laughs> the alternative, it is hard truth, yes. Hard yes. Truth. The, the alternative yes. is that your infection will not be treated. Mm -hmm. You will continue to be pumped with a more expensive one until finally your system will just collapse because the infection will run, uh, rupture the, the whole system. You know, the, when the infection runs in your system, it eventually affects everything. And you get organ, organ failure and everything and you die. Mm -hmm. So for me and for us here, the key issue is that we have very important tools here. We need to protect them for the sake of our people. Our constitution, as I said, requires that you put in place those mechanisms. The professionals, that is why they're there. That is why society creates pharmacies, for example. Our first president in 1972 directed that this country to start a degree program so that people can be de handled by people who understand this medicine. A degree program in, in pharmacy. In pharmacy. In pharmacy. Mm. Now, since then, we have trained masters and PhDs. Now, what is happening now? Despite that policy of government, there has been a recent trend where uh, even M MPs are being confused into changing laws so that people who have no qualifications have access to medicines. Pharmaceutical technicians, for example, who globally are only allowed to assist a pharmacist, have been allowed here to have... To run the show. To run the show. <laughs> which enough. is Just back, uh, back to your question on are there alternatives to yes, antibiotics. Yes. Uh, yesterday I was actually reading a paper published by Lancet. And in Europe they are trying to find some alternatives to antibiotics, like antibodies and vaccines and all these other things. But um, they are facing financial challenges. And it's not something that will just come up today. Okay, they have to go through different phases, different clinical trials. So if you're looking for an antibiotic alternative, it's not going to happen now, at least not in the next 20 years. Fair enough, we are having this conversation at the end of the World Antibiotic Awareness Week 2018. Where does the awareness begin from and who is supposed to do awareness in as far as antibiotics, the use and the misuse is concerned? Pharmacists. It's us people. Exclusively pharmacists. And other healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, okay? But because pharmacists are the experts in drugs, they should be at the forefront to tell people, um, this is how you use antibiotics. These are antibiotics. This is how you use them. This is how not to use them. You're not supposed to request them over the counter. You need to be treated when lab tests actually confirm that you have an infection. So we actually need to start educating our people. And I can congratulate the Ministry of Health. They have a policy on antimicrobial resistance. And one of the main objectives is actually to create awareness. Um, on Monday, they have uh, this week when we were having the um, NAP uh, week in Loratio, they've actually started producing now flyers to go to Common Mwananchi so that people actually know what are antibiotics, how to use them. So the campaign is there, but I think we need to put in more effort. Mm -hmm. Dr. Karanja, before we finish, I'd love us to talk about the counterfeit industry, which is approximated to be worth 400 billion shillings in Africa. What kind of a challenge does, does this pose to the pharmaceutical industry? Now, counterfeiting is a major problem, and it's a major problem because, again, people are looking to make money, and this is a, uh, something that affects big volume sales, medication largely, and it also happens in markets which are poorly regulated, like Kenya. What happens is people see if they can get away with it, if the laws will not catch up with them, if they can access the market, then they will do it. What do they do? They go to China, they say, can you produce this for me? Look exactly like the, the, the original. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are very good at making it even look better than the original. So it comes here, 
better than the original, the physical it appearance, the physical or, physical or, or, appearance. Or, or the content. Uh, to be honest with you, physical. even as a pharmacist, when you bring the two together, you may not be able to know the difference between the two. That means the public is even less able to distinguish. So how, what is supposed to happen there? There's supposed to be systems in place to prevent that happening. Regulations be put in place. The, 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 how do drugs come in? Right? Are the drugs registered? There is a policy in this country, drugs must be registered. They go through a process, right? Now, when you circumvent this process, when you allow everybody to come with briefcases and containers <laughs> packed with medicines, and you, allow, you have a distribution, di distribution chain that has quacks all over the place assessing, assessing these medicines, mm -hmm. that means you, are, you have lost control. Uh, Dr. Karanja, former president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, Dr. Sylvia Opanga, a lecturer at the University of Nairobi, both lecturers. Many thanks for making time for us, and we appreciate your input. Thank at you. At that so note, much. we are taking a short